glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them and be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the God and godly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Tonight we're going to look at this passage a little bit closely as we talk about the fiery trials of life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this night and the opportunity uh, from thy word to get a better grasp on this subject of trials and temptations persecutions and problems. Lord, all these things come into our life. I, mean, I know we certainly don't enjoy them per se at times, but Lord, they're there for a purpose and a reason. And Lord, we thank you that you, through these things, give us a lot of hope that it's not the end. In fact, in some cases, it might be just the very beginnings of something better. Lord, help us to grab that tonight in our own hearts and with the, with the trials that we may be going through right now. May we find some peace. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I believe as God's people, sometimes we've, we've maybe grasped some wrong expectations about the Christian life. You know, we get, the, get some wrong expectations. We expect maybe some things that God doesn't necessarily promise. Okay? And uh, whether we've vocalized them or we've just thought them, but maybe tonight you expected as a Christian that your life should be moderately problem-free. It should be moderately problem. I'm saved now. That means God can take care of everything, and, I should, and problems and life should be relatively problem free. And if there are any difficulties that come up, boy, they get easily resolved the way that I want them to be resolved. And uh, and and by the way, people will always be nice to me, regardless of my bad attitude or my good attitude. <laughs> Oh, well, they should be nice to me. I mean, if they're a Christian, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. well, yeah, sure. Uh, people will always be nice to me, are nice to us, regardless of our attitude, our behavior, and that God proves his love to me or us by simply blessing me with material blessings that I want. And that's generally the mentality, I think, I, I hate to say, but kind of the Western, if not American mentality, that's the way Christianity should be. It should be that way. It should be easy street. I mean, I got saved, I'm a child of God, and those are all great things, yes. But we live in a sin-cursed world. And you and I still sin. And we all have problems within that need to be dealt with. But this mentality can be a silent, silently behind, you know, kind of subconsciously in our mindset that, that, yeah, it should be that way. And then all of a sudden one day some reality hits home, Right? Some reality hits home. That problems do crop up. And that difficulties aren't easily resolved or quickly resolved. And that people aren't always nice to us. Even when we're nice to them. Or try to be at least. And that God doesn't give us everything that we want when we want it right now. And you know what can happen to people when they have those expectations in their mind? They fall out. They said, well, I tried God, and I guess he doesn't work. You know, there have been plenty of people over the years who have come to church for a little while and tried to work with them, and then they blow out. And you say, why? What did they do? Well, they were trying God. In other words, they wanted to see if God would give them a better life, which he would if they would obey him. But it's just like, unless God, you know, snaps his fingers, takes away my problems, and then I can move on with life, I'm not going to give him anything. Can I say this? You don't try God. You love and you worship him and you obey him. You don't try God. You don't use God just to get something that you want. Right. If that kind of mentality, you'll be, you'll be out of the Christian race long before you even get started. It doesn't work that way. You and I don't try God and just see if it, you know, uh, he, he makes my life better or easier. No, that's not necessarily going to be the truth, the case. It's not always easier. But reality hits home to those folks who maybe in the back of their mind have these expectations and then those things don't come to pass and then they get miffed at God, miffed at the church, miffed at other Christian people and they say, bye-bye, I'm not doing this anymore. And they keep thinking it's everybody else's problem except their own. Right. Except their own. Much of the fallout of Christian people has to do with faulty expectations regarding their lives. They got, a bad, they got bad expectations. 
not scriptural ones. See, God didn't promise us a, a problem-free existence, did he? And Jesus said very plainly the night before he was crucified, These things have I spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. Guess what? We live in this world, right? And, and uh, this world is full of problems and trials and chaos. It's been like that forever. We think, oh, it's getting bad. It is getting bad, but the thing is, it's always been bad. You read it, just read a little bit of history and you'll see that it's just always been bad. <laughs> But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. In other words, the world isn't going to have to dominate and will not dominate forever. But I like what it says here. Where do we find our peace? He says, in me. It doesn't say in your problem-free circumstances. It doesn't say in the times you get a job raise. It doesn't say in the time you get a spouse. It doesn't say in when you get more money. It doesn't say in anything that you can get in this world. It says, in me. In me. And the greatest lesson you and I will ever learn is to find our joy, first and foremost, in Him. And those times that we don't find it in Him, we will struggle. And sometimes intensely. And can I say, when we do struggle, God's trying to show you, you can't find any joy and peace outside of me first. The rest of the things that come in life, those are ice, that's icing on the cake. But it, he, as we might put it, is the full enchilada. Amen. He's everything. <laughs> Some of you love enchiladas, I know. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but you get what I mean. He's the main deal. And the more you get to know him, the more you, you the stuff of this world doesn't mean as much to you anymore. Because you find your peace, your joy, everything in him. But Paul reiterated the fact, though, and this is after he had been stoned. He said, Acts 14, 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith that we must, through much tribulation, enter in the kingdom of God. I highly doubt that any of us are going to face the tribulation Paul went through. And he went through some tri problems, let me tell you. But, I, but, it, but he is telling us here something that is true. That life is going to have tribulation. It is going to have problems. And the Christian life, yeah, there is no escaping that either. In fact, in some cases, you might inherit some extra problems. Really, problems, trials, and persecutions are really more the norm. In fact, for most of the history of Christianity, it has been persecuted. It has been persecuted. Now, in America here today, we have had a reprieve because we had some people in the past who, who understood the necessity or, or the blessing of religious freedom and, and allowing people to, dicta or to worship according to the dictates of their conscience. But those days may change as the, growing, as the growth of godlessness continues in our land and the spirit of Antichrist makes headway in our society. You know, in verse 12, it says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fire trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. You know, Peter is telling his audience is, don't get caught off guard with these fiery trials. Like, what? I didn't expect that to happen. Well, no, we can't think that things could never happen to us. Could never happen to us. I had a relative here, or some relatives a few years back, actually it was during COVID, that they... Um, they lost uh, what would be, I guess, a, a, a grandchild. The kid was a, the child was in an accident, and I remember talking. It was it was my aunt that I was talking to, and she said, "You know, you always hear these stories, and it's always somebody else, but that day, that became us. That became us." And I, and I thought about that. You know, we we don't always expect these things, and not do, uh, that we wish anything ill on anybody. But at the same time, too, we can't get this idea that nothing bad could ever happen to us. Yet how often, when the trials come, we get discouraged or, or have this idea that God ha must have a vendetta against me. That, that the reason these problems are coming, God is mad at me or doesn't like me. I mean, he likes other people or loves other people, but not me. Or he's just punishing me. Now, I will say the scripture does indicate that we do go through chastening. 
But you realize something here today, something about chastening, that you generally know what you're being chastened about. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know when, when I was a kid and I, and I got uh, in trouble, didn't happen much, but you know, that's another story. <laughs> but, you know, there was a reason why I got my chastening, if you will. And I knew what that was, what I didn't do or did or whatever the case might be. Some people, people think, oh, God must be mad at me, and they have no idea at what. But they, they, they just interpret the trial as, oh, this must be punishment. Not necessarily. Again, we do experience chastening, but we often know why we're being chastened to begin with. If you go to Genesis chapter number 42, this goes back to the story of a, a Joseph. And, of course, Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. And uh, you want to talk about some family problems, look at J Jacob's family in this situation here. But uh, by the time we get to chapter 42, Joseph has already ascended to, to be prime minister of Egypt there. And now the famine has hit. If you're familiar with the story, there was to be seven years of, of plentiful, followed by seven years of famine, of which hit the land of Canaan, where his brothers and his father were still living. And they get to, the, the brothers show up there on the scene in front of Joseph. Joseph recognizes them, but they don't recognize him. And he speaks to them through an interpreter, pretending not to know what they were saying. But to, Joseph kind of puts them through the ringer a little bit. But let's pick it up in verse 21 as they begin to interpret, the, the brothers are kind of interpreting the situation here, what they're, why they're experiencing the difficulty with this man they don't realize is their brother Joseph. It says in 21, verse 21 of chapter 42, And they said one to another, We are verily guilty concerning our brother, and that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us, and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. And Reuben answered them, saying, Spake I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child? And ye would not hear, therefore, behold, also his blood is required. And knew not that Joseph understood them, for he spake unto them by an interpreter. And he turned himself about from them, and wept, and returned again, and communed with them, and took from them Simeon, and bound him before their eyes. Notice here, they, they, they knew what the problem was. They, they knew the issue. They knew why they were experiencing some of this. Okay? So, just understand, not all trials are the result of, you know, our sin, per se. And if it is because of sin, that person and God tends to know what it is specifically. But sometimes God's people experience trials or persecutions simply for being faithful to Him. You know, 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now it says, all that live godly, that's a key word there, godly. In other words, you're striving to live right. It doesn't say, all they that live worldly shall suffer persecution. No, the reason people are living worldly is because they're trying to fit in with the world. Okay, But if you're going to live godly, you're going to live the way God wants you to live and strive to grow in that, you're going to deal with people that you evidently, you're, you're going to rub the wrong way. And you don't even have to necessarily try sometimes. You know, that happened to Paul. You know, he, it happened to Paul. And it happened to others throughout the scriptures. And even beyond the scriptures, we have, we have history of, of persecutions against people who were just simply trying to be faithful to the Lord. Now when these types of difficulties hit, and we could talk about a variety of, of them tonight, the next question we have to ask ourselves is, how does God want me to respond to this? How does God want me to respond to this? How do I navigate these issues, whatever form they come on, so that my life doesn't fall apart? but instead shine as a witness for Jesus Christ. You know, we don't, trials aren't meant to blow our lives apart. It's meant to enable us to be a, a, a witness of God's glory. So tonight, let's, let's talk about this a little bit more. As we want to try to get some, our mind wrapped around, okay, I'm going to face trials. I'm going to face persecution. I'm going to face problems. I'm going to face whatever. God, I don't want to fail you. I, I don't want to give up. I want to fulfill my calling. I want to fulfill my purpose. You left me here. I want to, I want to do right. I want to please you. How can I, how can I do that?
Well, tonight, let's consider, first off, what I call the struggle. We'll look at the first word. We're going to go word by word tonight. No, just kidding. That would, we'd be here a long time. Verse 12, beloved. Key word here, beloved. Remember, Peter is writing to Christian people under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. And this word, beloved, describes not just Peter's feelings, but God's feelings toward his people. This is how God describes his people. And you can see that in other verses throughout the scripture. Beloved. Beloved. You know, when trials hit, whatever form again that they take on, one of the first things that will come to the mind of a believer is that there will be question marks raised about God's love for me and for you. It's almost like, you almost predict it. The wicked one will sit on your shoulder and say to you, if God really loved you, why did he let this happen? He must not really care about you. If that hasn't happened to this person. Look what that person got. I guess God doesn't want to give you that because he doesn't really love you all that much. And you, you can see where the thought processes go all the way down the toilet. Because this is what begins to formulate in our minds that is honestly satanic suggestions. As at those moments, it becomes very critical for us to, to remember the truth. See, the devil works overtime attempting to convince God's people that God doesn't love them and tries to prove his case by planting thoughts within our minds by using what we see out in front of us as evidence against God. You know, he likes to plant the idea that God, you know what, God's actually withholding from you. You know, if he really loved you, why did he do this? Why did he allow that? Why did he withhold this? You know, that's kind of what happened with Eve and the tree. Instead of thanking God for everything that was around them, guess what? The devil tried to focus on what God appeared to be withholding from her. You know, ye shall not die. The minute you get that, you'll have everything you ever wanted. It's, it's, it's good fruit. You'll, you'll, you'll be able to discern between good and evil. You know, all this stuff. And instead of remembering everything else that was around her, all Eve could think about was that one piece of fruit. And she's like, you know what? God is withholding from me. And she took of it, right? And she ate of it. God is withholding from me knowledge that is desirable. And she fell for it. And sometimes we do too. We fall for that deception that, that God's not really as good as we thought he was. And the trials will be there to kind of be the evidence, at least so-called evidence, against him. See, when our minds doubt God's love for us, we'll naturally draw back from him. The Bible says draw near to God, right? But when we start thinking negatively about God like that, guess what happens? We start backing away. That's, that's the natural reaction. If you perceive that somebody doesn't like you, do you go up there and give them a big old hug? Now, that might be a good idea. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's what they need. But generally speaking, we tend to kind of back away or we kind of get out of dodge or, or, or whatnot when, when somebody's like that. Well, we do the same thing with God. It, it's an effort of self-preservation, which really ends up being self-destruction because we were never meant to function independent of our Creator. We were never mentioned to that, but that's what naturally happens. Being to doubt God's love, God's care, and we're not sure if we can really trust God with the situation or to tell us what to do on on it. And then we begin to question other areas as well. And it ends up in an effort of self-preservation becoming an effort of self-destruction. 
Trials have a way of revealing to us where the faultiness lies in our relationship with God because we are put in a position, sometimes all we can do is trust God to handle the situation in His way and His time because there is nothing that we can do about it. There's just nothing we can do about it physically. Now, that may, if that makes us uneasy, then our faith needs some strengthening. And trials can help strengthen that faith if we choose to respond to things God's way. But before the trial hits, one of the most helpful things to do is to have a consistent walk with God. See, what we need to do is make hay while the sun is shining. In other words, we need a good stockpile within our hearts a stockpile of truth about God's love before the trial hits. That would be really helpful. It doesn't mean you're not going to feel pain. It's not, it's not going, to, it's going to make you bulletproof, but it is going to give you something to fall back on when you begin to doubt on those things. You know, I had a preacher tell me here recently, he said, you know, you ought to do things he was talking in regards to just church administration things in the green tree. Because when the problems hit, it's very difficult. You can't really do much at that point in time. And sort of with us, too. It's hard. Also, okay, I, I need to find the love of God. Well, maybe it might motivate that, but, it, you know, there's a chance, too, you might get blown out because you didn't have a stockpile within. You spent more time away from God. And all of a sudden now, you, you don't have, there's not much for the Spirit of God to draw out of your heart. But to know and have assurance that God's love for you is, is rich and deep will make all the difference when those trials do hit. We're talking about how to prepare for this. I'm not saying you'll never experience pain, but it would help a lot. Maybe tonight, if you would have a consistent walk with God, and learn what it means, what his love means, or how he loves you, and the, and the, and, and the verses that, which are plentiful that explain that to you and I. Get in there before the trial happens and, and build that stockpile up within the heart. Because sometimes, if we, if we don't have anything within there, we won't have anything to draw on when it does happen. You know, I've known people who've gone through some deep trials. And some falter and some flourish, but it all has to do with how much and how close they are to their Heavenly Father. You know, you think about Job, he, he's synonymous with trial. You know, it, it was the first book of the Bible written, and the first book of the Bible was written about a man who went through a very steep trial. <laughs> Imagine that, huh? You know, but Job made an interesting statement in chapter 13, verse 15. I think some of us are familiar with it. Though he slay me, speaking of God, yet will I trust in him, but I will maintain my own ways before him. How, did Job, how could Job say that? Well, I think it's pretty evident by the earlier chapters of the book. Job had a pretty close walk with God. Pretty close. That was before there was even a Bible. I don't know exactly how that all worked, but, but Job had a very strong relationship to the point that when the fiercest trial hit his life, it wasn't that he wasn't sad. It wasn't that he didn't go through some difficult emotions, but he had a bedrock assurance that God would get him through. And he did. There are people today that won't go through a fraction of what Job did, but it'll knock them out of church. It'll knock them away from God. It'll knock them out because they're just Oh, God didn't do this for me. I'm done. It's like, it's just the littlest stuff. You know, it's sad. You know, I've got people today who are in prison for their Christian faith, and if, and if somebody doesn't give them a, a right look at church, it will be them, you know? Job could have this kind of faith because he walked with God. Well before the trial, this big trial hit. 
hey, if we've been hanging on, a, on by a thread spiritually before the trial, the thread will completely snap within it. It'll snap, just boom like that. If all we do is soak our minds and hearts with the junk of this world and the entertainment of this world, good grief, no wonder we fall apart the minute the trial hits. I imagine we all probably could stand to get a little more acquainted or far more acquainted with God's love for us based on His statements found in Scripture. Not how we feel, but what God actually says in His Word. Because that is the source of truth. And the truth shall make you free. Say, free from what? I don't know, things like fear, things like depression, things like discouragement. You know, those, those are kind of good things to be free from, right? But the truth is what sets you free. Not God giving you everything and giving me everything I want right when I want it right now. Amen? The truth. Here's one truth in regards to what I'm talking about. The Lord hath appeared unto me of old and unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. You know what everlasting means, right? An eternal love. Which means it never stops. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. It's an eternal love. Everlasting. It never stops. But I've been such a stinker. Well, guess who hasn't been? Everyone has been. But yet God chooses to love us regardless of that. Grasping these truths will help us be prepared for the day that the trial hits. And not knowing that truth will, will make us easy targets of the, Satan's deceptions otherwise. You have to get it into the heart. And do it now while in the good times. Say, so I'm going through the bad times now. Well, guess what? I should even motivate you to get more of it in at that time. You need that truth. Otherwise, you will struggle. You will struggle. Secondly, we see the suffering. Verses 12 through 16, it says, Beloved, and think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice in so much as ye are partakers of the Christ suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye for the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other man's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Here Peter communicates to us that we need to arm our minds with the reality that trials, and even fierce trials, can be or will be a part of of our Christian existence. And our natural reaction, of course, is naturally negative. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. But Peter wants us to reconsider that. Verse 13, it says, but rejoice. Now that's not our, our natural reaction. I get that. But one of the most profitable things we can do is, is in essence, suffer for Christ's stead. In other words, take it on the chin for doing right. For doing right. It appears that in doing so, we make the Lord look very good and very desirable. See, when trials hit, whatever form they come, our response to them will show those around us if our Christianity is real or not. You know, it's very easy to be happy and joyful when everything is going right for you, right? But to have that joy and have that peace and, have that, and, and, and continue to move forward faithfully for God when it's hard speaks volumes. Because anybody can, can say that something works for them when everything's going well. The proof of it is, does it still work for you when things are not going well, which, is a, which every person will experience throughout their life. And people in this world are looking, you, you know, the lost of this world are looking for answers during those times of difficulties and trials. And, and lost people go through them too, a lot as well, because of just the sin world we live in. And they're looking at this this avenue and this avenue and this avenue and this avenue, but none of them work because none of them are connected to the one that can give something very special. It's called grace. 
It's a divine empowerment from God that is only accessible if you have the Spirit of God living inside of you that happens at salvation. That's, you know, we talk about the peace of God, the pass of all understanding. That's the result of grace. God's grace coming upon you and helping you through those times. See, people are looking for something real. And if we can be real and faithful and even joyful, even in the midst of difficulties, he gives our faith a bit of credibility. It really does. In days past, we can read of people who suffered immensely for Christ. Physical torture, family banishment, death, all these horrible things. And their persecutors were hoping to stamp out their message, but it only proved to amplify it. It only proved to do the exact opposite. You know, in the book of Exodus, by the time Exodus opens up, the Jews had multiplied in Egypt, right? And there was a, a pharaoh that was raised up that did not know Joseph, didn't respect Joseph's contribution to their very existence as a nation. And if you know the story, the, the Pharaoh begins to persecute the Jewish people. And what was his point of doing that? To suppress them and to slowly but surely eradicate their, them as, as a perceived, perceived threat to Egypt. But we notice in Exodus 1, verse 11 through 12, oh, I didn't get that up there. Let's go there. Exodus 11. Or Exodus 1. Sorry. Exodus 1. I thought I got it in the slideshow. But we see here. Verse 11 of Exodus 1. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom and Ramses. Verse 12 is key. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. They thought that they would squelch the Jews. Instead, they ended up flaming a fire of growth. So how was that possible? Because the hand of God was upon them. Sometimes the greatest expansion of Christianity has been when it has been persecuted, actually. There's a reason why they, it was said that they turned the world upside down in the book of Acts. When they stoned Stephen there in, I believe it was Acts chapter 7, what happened in Acts chapter 8? They went everywhere. They were persecuted, yes, but they everywhere preaching the word. It just it went like a grease fire. You know, it just went everywhere. By the time Saul was converted and, and you know, things settled down, there were churches. Before there was just one church, but now there was churches throughout Judea and Samaria, and they went to Antioch and Cyprus, and they were just expanding left and right. Now I want to hasten to say too, sometimes God's people bring unnecessary persecution because of their foolish behaviors. And there is a difference between this, okay? Sometimes, sometimes God's people do some foolish things and act in a way where they bring upon their own persecution. And sometimes it's a, this uh, quote-unquote stand for truth they take is really a mask of prideful self-exaltation. And simply what they end up doing is reaping what they sow. The worst thing we can do is suffer, though, because of our own sin. Verse 15, uh, back in 1 Peter 4, it says, But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. He's saying, don't, if you're going to suffer, don't suffer for the wrong reasons, okay? Now, sometimes people think they are being persecuted, but in reality, they've done some dumb things or even sinful things. And they're just reaping the consequences of that. Verse 16 goes on and says, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Here Peter mentions the contrast in this verse. He says, If someone suffers as a Christian, let's focus on that word just briefly here. You know, the word Christian or Christians only appears three times in the New Testament. The first time was in Acts chapter 11. It was a, game, a name given to the people, the 
to the disciples at Antioch because of their Christ-like spirit. And it says there, if anyone suffers as a Christian, in other words, if we suffer because we are behaving like Jesus Christ, that brings God much glory and honor. In other words, you're just trying to live right, and people give you a hard time for it. However, they do. As I mentioned, some people get themselves in trouble because though they claim to be a Christian, they aren't acting like one. We can't claim this truth that God is being glorified regardless how much one may be claiming to be a martyr. I'm being persecuted. And you come to find out, you dig out, yeah, they're kind of rude at work. They do a sloppy job. They, they're obnoxious. They keep pecking at people. You know, that kind of stuff really... You're not... You're no martyr when you're irritating. <laughs> How does one know he or she is suffering as a Christian? We'll take the Jesus test. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. We studied this earlier in the series. For this is thankful if a man for conscience sake toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if you, when ye are buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but command, uh, committed himself to him that judges righteously. Are we acting and responding like Jesus did? Or are we lashing out and seeking revenge? Or are we even grandstanding? Say, so what, what do you mean by grandstanding? Basically boasting about being persecuted when it was our own rude behavior that caused the backlash. I know people today that brag about being banned from countries around the world. I'm like, no, it was because you were an idiot. That's a hard word, but some people do some really ridiculous stuff. I'm standing for Jesus when they're acting like a jerk. There's a difference. And and, and that kind of, we we want a Christ-like spirit, not a... Not an arrogant, I'm somebody type spirit. No, if you have to boast that you're somebody, then you are a nobody. To be all honest with you. God, that doesn't please the Lord. That doesn't honor, uh, that doesn't honor Jesus. Are we acting and responding like he did? Are we lashing out and seeking revenge or even grandstanding? Then, then that, that doesn't qualify it. But if we are, as a Christian, who is simply just doing right just trying to honor him, do right with a good spirit, even those at times will suffer. But God has a greater good in mind through it all. As we see, thirdly and finally, the sovereignty. Now God gives us some perspective in verses 16 through 17. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf, for this the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? God always starts with those who know better when it comes to judgment, okay? As working a greater good in their lives, particularly the, the reforming of their character. But he contrasts that with the fact that things are going to be far worse for those who ultimately reject salvation and experience the judgment of their sins. He says for verse 18, And if the righteous scarcely be saved, <laughs> where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? You think about that for a little bit. All the problems we go through will pale in comparison to the problems and the issues that, that the lost will eventually go through in hell. That's And... and some of the reason why God allows us to go through those, some of those things is to, is to be a, a lighthouse to those who are on that road so that they can know the reality of God and turn to God themselves. That's really what it's all about. But verse 19 tells us something very critical. It says, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in will doing as unto a faithful creator. See, the command here is to commit the keeping of our souls into God's hand because God is sovereign. 
He ultimately rules. When we come to grips with the fact that we will face trials instead of expecting easy street in life, and couple with that with the fact that regardless of what I go through, I'm in the hand of God through it all. And that God, that, that these trials actually have a greater purpose, a bigger purpose, a better purpose. Such as refining my character into the image of Jesus Christ. Such as glorifying Jesus so that other people can see him and be rescued from the hell that I was rescued from. I think the better will navigate them. Those problems and trials. We'll navigate them all the better. I'm not saying that they're going to be easy. I'm not going to put this, oh, and I can handle anything now. No, I'm not saying that, but I am saying trials don't have to destroy us. Trials don't have to knock us out of God's house. Trials don't have to knock us out of the Christian race. Trials don't not have to knock us out of faithfulness into what we were serving in. Trials don't have to do any of that kind of stuff. They can strengthen us. And, that, and, and God can use us for a lot more things than we ever thought possible. And I believe it will hinge on our ability to rest in the sovereignty of God, though, over all things. That God's in control, ultimately. And that God can use even these negative things for good. Romans 8, 28, very critical verse. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to His purpose. Can I ask you tonight, do you love God? Say, I love God. Well, that's good. Because whatever comes into your life and my life is meant to bring about a greater good through your life. So I just don't believe that. It's because you have a problem trusting God. It's because you don't believe God loves you. But the thing is, where else are you going to go if you don't go to God? Where are you, you going to go? You going to go to Buddha? Confucius? Muhammad? Dr. Spock? Dr. whoever? I don't know, what's the names? I mean, consider your other options here tonight. Don't have a very good list, do we? But God says, he, God doesn't tell us that we're going to have an easy street. What he tells us is just simply this. I'm there to help you through it, and I'm there to use it for a greater good. And you'll be rewarded for it. But you've got to stick with me. You've got to stick with me. Say, what if I'm about to fall off? Well, guess what? Reach up and let him grab your hand. Just reach up to him. See, the Christian life needs to rest upon the relationship that you have with him. And the closer you get to him, the all more ability you'll be able to get through that, whatever it might be. I don't know what's in your life right now. I don't know what's coming down the road for any of us. And I don't claim to, to have this all down personally. But if there are some things I can do to prepare myself and navigate this, I want to because the last thing I want to do is fall out of the Christian life race because there are people depending on me right now to stay faithful. People I don't even know. And and the same is for you too. There are people right now that look to you as an example, more whether you realize it or not. And... Uh, you fall out, guess what? You could trip them up from ever getting saved. I mean, there's some responsibility here. May God help us to navigate the fiery trials of life with His grace and His understanding so that we can come out on the victory side for His glory. Let's take a few moments. We'll just stand to our feet for a little bit here. The pianist is going to come play and for a few moments and I just want to give you each of us a little time the fiery trials of life will will come our way 
difficulties, persecutions, problems. Even nuances sometimes can get us thrown off kilter. The question is tonight, how do we navigate those things? Well, I think in summary, I just want to say this. you got to get yourself in the love of God every day. Build that relationship with God. Come to realize who He is for who He is as He reveals Himself. And that can only be found as you get into the Word of God and as you talk to Him. Say, what happens when the trials hit? I'm not going to say you're not going to experience pain and discouragement and all those negative emotions, but at least if you if you have had the relationship with God, you know where you can run to. And there's a grace there that's available to all of God's people tonight. A grace that you can't manufacture or work up, but in bestowed upon you by the hand of God. Power within. A strength that comes from the presence of the Spirit of God in your life and mine. And the trials we go through, we, we learn just how strong that sustaining grace is to get us through to the other side. I'm glad one thing about our trials, we don't have to go through them alone. I am so thankful for that. But may we not be people either that are bringing our own problems upon ourselves because of our own foolishness and pride, self-righteousness. You know, sometimes we, we ourselves in those positions and if we've done that just I encourage you to learn from the mistake I think we've all made those mistakes at some point in our life so that so that we can uh, please and honor him Father, we thank you for this night. Thank you for the word of God that reveals so much to us. Oh, God, I pray that you'd help us as we go through those trials of life. They're not easy, Lord. Sometimes they're scary. Sometimes they're overwhelming. But, oh, thank you for the, the fact that we have the... And I pray that each one of us tonight would learn more of the greatness and goodness.